Welcome to Positive Disintegration, a path to authenticity. In today's Quick Bite, Chris and I are talking about socialization, what it is, how it impacts our life, and how it extends through our life, meaning that we have to continually fight the goblin hordes of socialization that crop up in our minds. Hello listeners, welcome back to Positive Disintegration. I'm Emma Nicholson. I'm Dr. Chris Wells. And today we're talking about socialization. Yeah, it was really your idea, so I'm letting you kick it off. (laughs) Okay, thanks. Sorry. Yeah, because I've just been having some thoughts about socialization and sort of how I first conceptualized it when I was reading about the theory many moons ago, because we've sort of been having a few reminiscent episodes recently talking about, you know, the beginning of our podcast journey uh, and how I think about it differently now. Um, So I just kind of wanted to touch on a few of my thoughts on that and get your take on how you perceive it in that light. Sounds good. So I guess where I want to start was, the fluid nature of how I perceive socialization and I guess how I conceptualize where and when the dynamisms come in. And I suppose this goes back to when I was writing about my life and trying to sort of examine it through a Dabrowski lens. And two things from that exercise really jumped out at me. The first was how early in my life as a kid I showed the seeds of dynamisms or the start of dynamisms, whether or not that actually led to any growth is, you know, up for debate. But I started to see some of the emotions and and some of the stuff that I've been reading about in the theory very early. And then I started to think about how socialization fit into that picture, you know, and what socialization was in essence. And rather than say it as socialization comes first and then later you get dynamisms and you start to experience growth, I've started to see a lot of overlap um, between those and started to also see socialization as an ongoing process and an ongoing force that continues to come into our life, um, you know, whether that be through media or you know, expectations of society. So my my shift in thinking around what socialization is and when it impacts us is kind of changed dramatically. It's interesting. I'm surprised, I guess, that we haven't talked about this more already. I feel like from my perspective, you know, my bachelor's degree is in sociology. And so I think I had a very different perspective of socialization, maybe just because I've kind of studied that through a different lens. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's it's been interesting for me to think about socialization um, in terms of the theory after, you know, having so many thoughts about it from like the sociological perspective. This is something I've talked with Frank about, or I used to talk to Frank about. And it's interesting to me, like, I have, I can give so many examples of ways that I was problematic <laughs> When I first started living with my partner because of just things that I internalized when I was a kid as this is the way things are without ever rethinking them until I lived with someone who was like, why do you do this? Why are you such a tailgater? Why do you think that we have to have a drink every time we go to the airport? I mean, these are things that I internalized like from home. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Like from my parents. Yeah, it's and it's funny you say that. I part of why I started thinking about this was I also started thinking about how trauma and pain, it's almost like a Pavlov's dog response of how much stuff in my past still affects how I behave today, even though it happened a very long time ago and it, you know, it bleeds into my current life and it bleeds into my relationships and you know, particularly with, with my partner, like hard lessons that I learned from my ex, like that, that pain and that trauma still taints 
the way that I behave today. And I find I get I get really guilty and I, I feel a lot of shame. Um, and I just didn't realize how pervasive this freaking thing was. Like the, the fact that I'm still carrying some bastard's baggage like 15 years later into my current relationship really irritates me, but it just shows like how much this sort of sticks. Um, and then I started thinking about all the other elements of socialization as well, like the directions that they come from, like you know, social media, media, like all these messages that we keep getting bombarded with every day of you know, how we should behave and what the expectations on us are. And like, they're, they're never ending. <laughs> um, and in that way, it sort of started reframing my thinking about socialization as an ever present force in our life you even if we work on ourselves and even if we come become more resistant to it it's always there whether or not we want to acknowledge it i think the key is to pay attention and to be aware of why you do things you know once you start really examining your motivations and you give some thought to why you are the way you are and where your beliefs came from it's you realize like what a house of cards <laughs> it's been and like how much of what you believe or what you do came from other people and wasn't something that you chose yourself. And it also like, I think, I mean, just from my experience, like even just the examples I gave of like being a tailgater or uh, needing to drink <laughs> at the airport. Like those are two things I don't do anymore. You know, I am a very different driver now than I was when I first met Jason and I rethought a lot of stuff, but just the reality is that until we have a point in our lives where we wake up to ourselves and we wake up to the fact that we have brought in all of this external stuff without being critical of it until we have that moment, like we're just we're repeating patterns. We're having a unilevel experience of life until we wake up and start really examining what we're doing, why we're doing it, where it came from. So yeah, I mean, I agree with you that it's very pervasive. It's coming at us from all fronts. And there's a lot of different ways that it looks. You know, I mean, right now, like I'm working on a presentation and thinking about ableism. I mean, ableism is a pervasive problem in that it's everywhere. You know, I mean, it's just, it's not something that we question the way we question other isms like racism or sexism. We accept prejudice and discrimination against disability without really confronting it or challenging it. And so we have this internalized ableism. We believe that we should be normal and strive to fit in and be like other people, or at least, I mean, that's not how I feel, but for a lot of my life, I wanted to be normal. I wanted to fit in and I didn't want to be me. When I started really confronting that in myself and questioning why I wanted to be normal, what did that even mean? Who is normal? I don't know. It's like, it's a whole process. And it comes from the realization I had, is it comes from the past, but it also comes from the present as well. And it will continue to come in the future which was a bit of a – it was a bit depressing but also really awakening at the same time. It's like you're going to have to keep fighting this fight forever. You know that. Like even if you dig down to the roots of all your shit that you've dragged from the past with you and even if you manage to unravel everything, which is an impossible task really I think, but even if you did somehow manage to unravel everything and question everything that you believe – and understand where it all came from and dig everything out at the roots, this thing is still going to, stuff's still going to get thrown in your face and you're going to have to find a way moving forward to deal with socialization as well as deal with what's already happened to you. Once you do start waking up to the fact that you have been living like on automatic pilot and not creating your own reality... Like once you reach that point, you're much better equipped to deal with the socialization of the future or the present even. If there's one thing that is really emphasized often in the theory, it's the deliberate nature of multi-level growth and 
you know, what he was calling advanced development. Like it's conscious, it's deliberate, it's self-created. So that becomes a way of life once you have these dynamisms operating in your life that make that experience of reality possible. And so once you get to a place where you're being deliberate and not automatic, I mean, I I have to believe that that's half the battle. I think the belief in the emotional attachment is is the other half of the battle because no matter how many times you cognitively tell yourself something, sometimes your heart just doesn't want to let go of that belief. And you're right, it's ongoing work to, to repeat those messages until you can truly let go of some of the stuff. I don't know if I should go down this rabbit hole. Ah, oh, fuck it, I will. Um, one thing I got from watching uh, heathen videos on YouTube is a lot of people who be, become pagan and polytheist find that they're still dealing with what they call suitcase Jesus. So you're still dealing with latent aspects of Christianity, if that was your upbringing, that you're lugging around with you. And then every now and then suitcase Jesus will pop out and you go, oh, that's still a thing that I've got hung over from you know, a religion I, I no longer follow. And a, a good ex- example of that is, so you can tell yourself that I no longer believe in the Christian concept of hell, but the fear of it may linger with you for a very long time. So you, there's a repeated message that has to go on because somewhere deep down in your soul, you're still quaking in your little boots of the, the fact that you might meet Satan one day, even though it's no longer part of your current like experience um, or your current practice. So I think that, that you're right. There's that ongoing work of self-examination and continually doing that stuff, but like it's got to con- it's got to go on until you can really like believe it somewhere in the depths of your soul. That's true. Often the head knows something that the heart doesn't know yet or hasn't got there yet, and so it's true. This is an interesting topic. There's a lot of different directions that it can go. It's tough because I, I have my own thoughts on this and my thoughts from people I've worked with. And I mean, I see that some things are just so hard to to walk away from. Or, I mean, in terms of beliefs or prejudices or, and I'm thinking now of like my own battle of trying to get people to think about ableism, like not to come back to that again, but this is a real issue that we have in our society where we really elevate like able bodies and this is how we should be. Like we have this, you know, ideal of like how we should look or what a family should look like or what marriage should look like. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is like heteronormative. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that have changed in the world. Like since I was young at camp over the summer, I was telling the kids that, you know, when I was in high school, like no one was out, like no one would admit when I was in high school, like to being gay or lesbian. I mean, let alone being like trans or non-binary. It's like we were in the dark ages, but it was just over 30 years ago. I mean, it wasn't really that long ago, but that has really changed for the better to some extent, although it's still like a shit show here in America when it comes to there's a ton right now of like anti-trans legislation and I don't know, it's fraught. I think you're right on this stuff because this goes back to what we're saying about, you know, the head believes it, the heart takes time to catch up. And even though there has been progress in the dark places of the internet and, you know, in the quiet corners where people are whispering with each other, there's still a lot of like phobia and bigotry and as you said ableism and all sorts of shit going on and as a society it's going to take us a long time for attitudes to actually catch up with with some of that stuff and as you said there's going to be resistance on that part too so 
you took you were talking about anti-trans legislation i'm thinking of the rise of incels on the internet um and some of this you know people going back to they want to go back to traditional stuff shit goes kicking and screaming you know it doesn't go quietly and even within ourselves um the things that we want to let go of don't always want to go quietly because you know you you question one thing you reevaluate it but that's how powerful socialization is is you're going to get all these voices in your head telling you that don't be that way you're going to go to hell don't do that everybody's going to hate you you're not going to fit in don't do that your parents are going to be disappointed in you so it's like those little goblins sitting on your shoulder the entire time actively trying to get you to give up on the very self-reflection that's going to free you from them because they're not going to go quiet. That's true. They're not. (laughs) Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to get people to confront their stereotypes and their existing beliefs and, and think about things in a different way. And that's part of overcoming your conditioning and your socialization. You know, I mean, you have to be willing to examine it but like you said, I mean, there are there's more than just the intellectual activity of thinking about it. You know, it's more than just a an intellectual sorting out process, the like the discovery of your hierarchy of value values and, you know, creating that system for yourself of like this is how I'm gonna act in the world. Yes, between point A where you are with your map of your hierarchy of values. And point B, being your personality ideal of where you want to get to, there is a sea of goblins between (laughs) those two points that you're going to have to fight your way through. And in the meantime, society is going to keep pouring more goblins onto the battlefield in front of you. Like They're not going to stop. No, they're not going to stop. But as you grow in confidence in your development and you see the fruits of your effort, then... I think it does get a little easier. You know, the more you believe in yourself and your direction and your path, whatever, however you want to put it, the easier it is to to avoid like letting other people's voices get in your head or to get caught up in being worried about what other people think or you're finally able to let go of external validation and needing somebody else to tell you that you're on the right path or that you've made improvement. That's a big deal. I mean, it's it's a lot to get to the point where you don't need to hear that from other people. I mean, not that it's not always nice to hear like good job or, you know, like the feedback that we get for the podcast. I really appreciate hearing that people resonate and that we're making a difference. But even if we weren't hearing from people, I think that I would feel confident that we were doing our best, you know, in this work. And you've always challenged me on external validation that feedback is good. You know, people can pull you back into to line, but it's being able to sort of balance that with that internal compass telling you, yes, I know I'm heading in the, the right direction. And I think I've started to see those external moments of feedback to say, just look down at your compass. Like the, it's just a reminder or a check to have a look down and make sure you are heading in the right direction. You know, if someone says you're being an asshole, that's just a prompt to look at your compass and go, oh, shit, yeah, I am being an asshole. I need to change direction and be thankful for that moment rather than just taking it on the face value and them saying you're being an asshole and go, oh, my God, I'm being an asshole. You've got to do that extra step of check your own compass first. Um, And then those two things can go hand in hand. And it's been actually you talking about the value of feedback that sort of prompted me to think in that direction. Well, good. I mean, I'm glad that, that it helped. It's, it's hard because like you, you can't just blindly believe that you know what's right and that you're on the right path without allowing in feedback from others. If other people are telling you you're being an asshole you would do well to take a look at that and not just reject what they're saying and you know defend against it like you have to be open to hearing what other people say you know you have to have a willingness to be corrected it's not easy 
like I would say that having a willingness and an openness to being corrected is the sign of someone being on the right path, you know, to the more rigid you are and the more sure you are that you're right, the more you really need to take a look at that. <laughs> but I'm thinking about like, I I wanted to mention before I even got into that, I meant to say that, you know, there's this book called The Four Agreements. And that's what I've been thinking of, you know, over the past few minutes. It's like, it's just like these four statements that I was thinking about last night. And I've, I mean, I read this book a few years ago, but um, God, do I even remember what all four of them are? I may need to look it up. It's like, be impeccable with your word. Oh, don't take anything personally. That's the one that I wanted to tie to this. Um, don't make assumptions and always do your best. But the don't take anything personally is the one that I was trying to think of. Well, thanks, Chris, for coming on this goblin filled journey. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, I wish that I had more like words of wisdom to wrap up this issue of socialization. I think that you just have to be on the lookout for it. You have to be a critical thinker. Yeah, and don't be one of those people that says, I've gotten to level four and I'm fine and this is never going to affect me again because it will keep coming at you. The goblins will not stop. That's right. They'll keep coming. Right, well, thanks, Chris. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Emma. It is always a pleasure. And thank you to our listeners. We always enjoy having you with us as well. Continue your path to authenticity through the links in the show notes. Subscribe to our Substack newsletter for stacks of cool things delivered straight to your inbox. Explore the Dabrowski Centre, email us, or join us on social media. And don't forget to show your love by liking, subscribing, grabbing some positive disintegration merch, or leaving us a rating or review on your podcast platform.